Hello, everyone. I'm Praveen Raghuraman, uh, Director of Product Management, responsible for the access control and gateway solutions. And uh, my name is Bala Swaminathan. I'm a senior manager in engineering and work on some parts of what we're going to talk about, and also in the Citrix virtual apps and desktops uh, service. Yeah, and today we're excited to talk about uh, the access control solution, sort of give you a deep dive into the, how the solution works and how you can actually implement it in your deployments. Uh, before we proceed, just a quick disclaimer. Mm -hmm. This work? No? All right. Can you advance the slide there? I think it was working. Just, just do this. Got it. All right. I'll just do this. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. All right. So just a legal disclaimer on uh, timelines and things like that, uh, which basically could change. But. Uh, we, what we'll, well, we have a, quick, a packed agenda. What we want to do is just provide you a quick overview of the solution, uh, talk about how we can address some of the core use cases, and what are the capabilities that, that we have within the access control solution. We will go into uh, four key use cases, which are part of the overall solution, and then uh, we'll do the, uh, de a few demos and kind of summarize you know, how we bring it all together. There will be a few features that are on our roadmap under NDA, so we'll be also you know, kind of giving you a glimpse into that. With that, so let's, uh, let's actually dive into the solution overview. So uh, before we go into actually what the solution is at, like, I just wanted to sort of uh, you know, paint the picture around what are the core needs that our customers have been telling us, which is driving really the development of the solution. So really, there are four key requirements when it comes to delivering secure access to apps. One is uh, the ability to do single sign-on, and it's a very important experience feature, but at the same time, it also reduces the overall uh, threat perimeter because you don't have to now log into 50 different sites and you know share your passwords there. So that's a very key requirement, and being able to do that along with having the core authentication mechanisms is a key requirement. The second thing is when you are dealing with SaaS applications or web applications or different kinds of uh, applications that your employees may be using for work, protecting IP and providing governance around how those applications are actually consumed is a key use case. The third is um, there may be web threats, uh, all, all kinds of data and, and links that may be actually within even sanctioned applications that are now becoming attack vectors. So how do we actually provide uh, the ability to you know, have, isolate that content and apply the right controls? And the fourth thing is being able to gain visibility and insights so you really can manage risky behavior from a user perspective and then drive all that through closed loop control within the uh, solution. So those are sort of the four broad areas that customers have been telling us. And what that maps to is these four critical capabilities, uh, which is around authentication, being able to do secure access and single sign-on, uh, enforcing policy control, and then bringing analytics to help with uh, the overall solution. And that's what access control is all about. It's a cloud-based service. And what it does is we actually integrate all these capabilities into one holistic solution and <coughs> deliver it so that you can use the same uh, single solution, whether you're you know, delivering SaaS applications or whether you're doing web applications, which are hosted enterprise applications, or you have you know, users going to the internet for sanctioned or unsanctioned content. And the main uh, capability is around, from an end user perspective, being able to deliver that single sign-on experience. Uh, here we basically uh, use the Workspace app as the, as the main a uh, unified pane of single pane of glass, and being able to use that on any device and under different you know sort of uh, uh, locations, whether it's office or remote. The actual core capabilities of security control are part of what access control really delivers. And here uh, we'll be going into actually some of these capabilities in depth. And third is uh, making sure that we have the visibility and the analytics, particularly much really detailed understanding of user risk, uh, user scores. Uh, and being able to get uh, detailed reports into what kind of data and content is actually being accessed. Uh, we launched Access Control last year uh, and uh, in August, and ever since we've actually been getting a lot of requests from customers. So I just wanted to give you a quick view of all the new capabilities that we have actually added. There's a lot that has been uh, happening, and uh, there are a few items that are actually on our roadmap, which we are very re excited about in further you know, enhancing the overall solution. I'll be covering all of this and going into the details uh, all along the presentation. So let's now look into how it works. 
So the solution actually is delivered from an admin perspective through these four key tiles. So when you log into your Citrix Cloud console account, you will see a variety of different tiles. Access control is a solution that is also a tile. So when you request a trial, you actually get entitled to all of these four different tiles. And actually, that's a very important distinction because uh, many customers or uh, prospects have asked us, how do I get you know, the overall solution? Uh, and all of these tiles actually compose that, uh, that broader solution that we're talking about as access control. Now let's talk about some of the, uh, you know, the core capabilities. And the first one we really want to address is multi-factor authentication. So uh, we've received a lot of requests, obviously, on what is the roadmap and what are the capabilities we have with uh, multi-factor auth today. So we are very excited to announce that we have native two-factor auth built into Citrix Cloud using the um, AD plus token mechanism. And from an end user perspective, it's a fairly simple uh, three-step process where they, when they log into their workspace, they will be presented with a token uh, uh, challenge that they have to enter. And there's a process to pre-register their device using any third-party SSO app. Uh, either it can be a Citrix uh, SSO app or a third-party uh, authenticator like Google or Microsoft. And what they do is they basically enter that token that they have from that authenticator app into the application, and they get single signed in. So this is a solution that's fully delivered within <coughs> Citrix Cloud, and it's available right now in GA. For more advanced use cases, what we've done is we've actually gotten a lot of feedback from some of our customers and partners where they actually want to leverage their existing investments they've already made with their gateway on-prem. So we are also announcing the availability of this gateway to be uh, something that we can actually connect and use that to federate to all other advanced mechanisms. So things like being able to you know, connect to Google or Okta or any of the other third-party IDP, or even being able to use Ping or uh, RSA or uh, let's say Duo for doing second factor auth using Radius or any of these mechanisms. All these are already supported with the gateway on-prem today, and you can now use it along with Workspace. And uh, what it also does is it actually allows you to leverage your existing investments and helps unblock the migration by moving on that cloud journey. So let's see how that experience actually uh, looks like. So you have your uh, on-premises gateway that you may be using already for two-factor or advanced multi-factor auth. And what we've done is, uh, from an end-user perspective, you can configure this gateway to be really an OIDC server. And you make an OIDC, OAuth policy on your gateway. Once you do that configuration, when end users connect to your workspace, they will get redirected for that request back into the gateway. And there, depending on what particular configuration is there for two-factor or multi-factor, that will execute. And when the result comes back, we're now able to authenticate and log the user into their workspace. So it's a fairly seamless and easy process from an end user perspective. And uh, it, it actually kind of allows you to you know, leverage your existing on-prem investments. So this capability obviously allows you now to interoperate with an ecosystem of third-party <coughs> providers like the likes of Duo and RSA and, and what have you. And obviously, we have things like smart card authentication, in, integrated with Windows authentication, and several other capabilities, which now instantly become available in the con context of workspace. So let's now review how single sign-on, what have we done in single sign-on, and you know how that process works. So from a single sign-on perspective, really, it's, it's all about SaaS, and the usage of SaaS is proliferating. So all of these common applications that we see are supported as predefined templates within uh, the access control uh, console. So when you go into the gateway service console, what you will see is a fairly simple three-step process to publish uh, these applications and configure them so that end users can use them. Uh, and in this picture, I al also have that, that blob on the, on the left. What that is, is that is basically your X509 certificate, uh, which is available also for you to download and then uh, upload as a metadata XML file, or being able to you know, copy paste that into the service provider that you have for SaaS. So it's a, it's a fairly straightforward option. And the other thing is we've, we, at this time, support SAML 2.0 and have close to 300 uh, built-in <laughs> templates. And if you have any applications that you're using and you would like us to add that, you know, uh, you can let us know. Or you also have the option to be able to directly configure that with, and uh, select your own app as well. 
So let's walk through how SAS actually, how this uh, single sign-on actually works. So here I have in this picture on the left, the Workspace app. And as you'd notice, the Workspace app has evolved from what used to be your erstwhile receiver with an embedded engine built into it. There's a networking client which allow, and, and rich management API that actually send all the data into Citrix Analytics. So when the user, the very first time when a, a user has logged in and they connect to Citrix Cloud, uh, what Gateway Service does is, after the authentication happens, it sends the list of all the enumerated applications. So you actually get that list now populated within your workspace app. But you haven't yet single signed on. So very first time what you do is, you initiate a connection to, let's say, one of the tiles in, in, uh, in one of the sanctioned apps. At that point in time, we do the single sign-on SAML assertion uh, based on the configuration that's already been provided. This could be Salesforce or Office 365 or any of these commonly used applications. And pr pretty much from that point, we have the cookie, which is now used for the session to continue, and the user is now directly logged in. So they're single signed on. We continue to use that token and keep asserting it, and we can you know, seamlessly give them the experience on, in workspace. The other important thing here to notice is that we send all the uh, data from the workspace app, and these events <coughs> are sent into Citrix Analytics for being uh, able to collect much more broader uh, visibility and giving you insights on what kind of behavior is happening. So that's the process there. Now, what about, say, you have an application, you have applications like Outlook Web Access or SharePoint or SAP or any of these different applications that you may be hosting internally within your own enterprise uh, in your data center. So you can now use Gateway Service actually to be able to provide the same simplified experience using the workspace without actually requiring to have a VPN. So, this is really a much more simpler and easier seamless way from an end user experience perspective. So we have that capability available right now within Gateway Service. Uh, it's available in Tech Preview and we will be uh, going uh, available in GA very soon, uh, by hopefully by end of, this, uh, in, end of this quarter in Q2. So the main requirement for uh, being able to do this is you have to uh, use one of the you know, supported uh, single sign-on uh, methods we have. We currently support Kubros, forms-based, and uh, redirection. And we're also working on some of the newer mechanisms. And also, one other thing that's important is that you need what is called as a gateway connector. And think of this as a fully managed appliance uh, that we send, that you actually can download and deploy within your, your data center. And a common best practice is to be able to use, to use this gateway connector in an HA pair mode so that you have full resiliency and redundancy in terms of you know, connections. Uh, some details about this connector, it actually is actually a virtual machine uh, and runs in a single IP mode with DHCP. All communication from the connector out to the cloud is fully encrypted with, in, a, uh, you know, uh, in a TLS channel. And the other thing is that we only make outbound connections. We don't make any connections inbound. So similar to what you may have known about how the gateway service works with ICA proxy, the same mechanism is used here. Now these connectors are fully managed by Citrix, so these are automatically upgraded, and uh, you can also monitor their health by actually looking at a very simple dashboard which gives you a view into the health and status of that, uh, of that connector. So I'm gonna show you a, a very quick demo, sort of how, what the admin experience and the end user experience looks like. So I'm going to log in uh, first in, into Citrix Cloud, and uh, here we go to the gateway service tile. And you would see these options. You'll see an option to add a web app or a SaaS app. That's your list of all the uh, applications. What I'm going to do is choose inside my network as the option, and we're going to configure uh, Outlook Web Access. So we enter the name, uh, the actual FQDN or the, uh, that, you, that will be used to reach this application within your corporate network. And obviously, you can customize and you know, set up an icon when it shows on the workspace. Uh, I'm going to enable enhanced security. This is a new capability, as I mentioned. We've added this year. And you have to publish the gateway connector. So I just selected that. And you have all these different um, single sign-on methods. We've selected forms-based. And what we're going to do is just go ahead and configure all the different parameters, like the assertion, uh, the actual URL, the username, password. And once we, once we complete that process, uh, your application will be ready to be then uh, made available on the workspace. 
So now it's available in the library, and uh, we need to uh, associate the users that can actually go ahead and use this application. So you see that Outlook Web Access shows up here. And I go into what is called as a Manage Subscribers um, option, where you can select a user or a domain of users. Uh, I've selected a user group, and the app is published. Now, when the end user logs into their workspace, they will actually see this icon. Um, when they click on it, it's treated exactly the way we treat, we treat any other SaaS application. I have the security controls enabled. So when you launch Outlook, uh, you see that uh, the watermark appears. Uh, also um, enabled uh, web filtering, so that's where you see if there's a bad link or any form of uh, uh, malicious link that is going to get blocked. So pretty much all the controls and security capabilities that we've had with access control for SaaS are now available also for your uh, hosted on-prem apps. So I'm going to hand it over to Bala, who's going to walk us through some of the policy control mechanisms. Thank you. All right, so once the users have logged on, then comes the most fun part. Every administrator's dream job. How to keep your security department happy, how to keep your end users happy, right? Um, from a security perspective, right, as Praveen mentioned at the very beginning, there are four critical things. You know, single sign-on for a consistent experience, but after that, you want to make sure your intellectual property is being protected. You want to make sure that any uh, browsing that is going on does not bring in any sort of vulnerability into the, into the corporate network, right? And what kind of uh, information are end users uh, browsing to? They may be inadvertently going into certain places. So those are compliance uh, issues, right? So to handle these three types of challenges, you need cloud app controls. We're going to talk a little bit about how to control the end user behavior so that they don't inadvertently cause any kind of uh, IP uh, challenges. When they're browsing, you want to make sure that there are all the threats that are out there are being isolated. So we'll talk a little bit about browser isolation. And the last part is about content filtering. So in the earlier uh, demo that um, Praveen walked through, he clicked this enhanced security button. Really what happens behind the scenes is with that one click, you control end user behavior, you control what kind of uh, content they can uh, peruse, and in addition to that, you also control their ability to look at, uh, you know, go to a variety of sites without bringing in any type of malware, any kind of uh, uh, vulnerability into the organization, right? So when you click this button, what you quickly notice there is Clipboard access can be restricted. Printing can be restricted. Certain types of navigation. Maybe you just want them to be in a particular sanctioned app. Maybe it's just get in there, do your SAP work, or do your uh, you know, work day, and then you're out, right? And restrict downloads. And the, in, the, in the previous launch, you also saw a watermark display, right? So all of these capabilities come with one click. This is controlling end user, um, uh, what they can do and cannot do. In addition to this, behind this, there are two other things that happen. All the content goes through a uh, web filtering mechanism. And in addition to that, dynamically, depending on the situation, the entire browsing can be completely isolated out of your corporate network. So talking about content uh, filtering, right? Somebody may go into a SaaS app, and they may be working on something, and there's a link that leads to one thing which leads to another. And inadvertently, the users may end up in a place where they should not, right? So today, Citrix offers almost 190 plus categories that you can, you can restrict. So these are done by categories. Every website is uh, you know, categorized, uh, and, and websites have uh, reputation scores as well. So you have the ability to say end users can only peruse external unsanctioned websites that have a reputation of four. You know? or you can only go to certain sites that are safe from a browsing perspective. And what you get are three options. Traditionally, you know, most uh, products give you a black and white list, but Citrix is the only uh, company that offers you a third mechanism called redirecting to secure browser. This is where you keep your end users happy as well, because if they want to peruse social media and other acceptable general forms of accepted um, uh, media, right? You can let them peruse it, but just not inside your corporate network. So access control in, in, in conjunction with Secure Browser offers you that 
unique capability. All right, so how, does, how do you decide what's allowed and, and uh, what's not allowed and where to, um, where to direct the end user's uh, session? So we have a sophisticated algorithm, but I'm going to break it down to you so that it's easy to understand. Citrix, of course, has its own internal traffic that needs to flow to its services so that things work properly. Those are by default allowed. And the second thing is if it's a SaaS application that you publish, like the example you saw in the previous demo, those are allowed. Everything else by default takes on an extreme security posture where they are blocked. But then if they are not blocked, if this is not part of your blacklist, then we look at how to redirect it into secure browser. So it may be that in your SaaS app, there's a link that leads you into a, into a LinkedIn or a Facebook or something like that. Those are immediately launched into a uh, sandbox. So I've been mentioning Secure Browser a couple of times, so let me just give you a quick idea of how this architecture works. What really we do behind the scenes is we have an isolated browser that runs in Citrix Cloud. We manage it, we instantiate it, and it offers three important functionality. Isolation, containment, and privacy. What I mean by isolation is whatever the end user does is happening in a browser that is outside your corporate network and happening within Citrix Cloud. That is isolation. If inadvertently a user ends up in a place where they should not, it's all contained within the secure browser environment. So it has no zero impact to your corporate networks. And third, when I say what I mean by privacy is what happens at the end of the session is the entire uh, context is deleted and completely reset. So every time somebody logs in, you are guaranteed to start in a known clean state. You cannot even reconnect back there. So with that background, let's talk a little bit about how is this being used in the access control context, right? So here's an end user that logs in into their workspace app. They have the workspace app installed on their managed device. And when they log in and they are about to launch their SaaS app, the SaaS app, when you have the enhanced security enabled, is going to go through the web filtering. When it notices that the application or, or the user is clicking on a link that is not sanctioned, then what it does, well, if it is a sanctioned SaaS app, it's just going to directly redirect uh, into the particular SaaS application here. If you happen to click into a URL that is not sanctioned, it's going to redirect that into a secure browser service now, you may be worried, well, is, does that mean the end user is now able to peruse any site? Not at all, because what happens is this, even the secure browser service is intelligent enough to know that this needs to be redirected back into the web filtering service that's available as part of the access control. And then it goes to some of these normal, highly reputed sites. Right? So this is the way in which you control um, IP, you control web filtering, and you also control isolation. But the most, more common case may be that some of your uh, end users may be launching a native browser. So what happens when they launch uh, a native browser and log in into uh, Citrix workspace? At this point, we notice that this is coming from an endpoint that is not a Citrix workspace app, and we redirect the entire session into Secure Browser. And so one way or the other, end users end up within a Citrix workspace app, because we have a version of Citrix workspace app that also runs within Secure Browser. Either it's on your managed device or it's in the uh, Citrix uh, Secure Browser service. One way or the other, you have a workspace app running. So from here, the same web filtering happens, and going out to any of these unsanctioned URLs will continue through this. Right? So we've covered, this is the way in which access control offers you the capability to protect your IP, isolate any kind of browsing, and also make sure the content that is being uh, perused is compliant with the regulations that you set in place. At, at this point, how do I understand, you know, what is my user behavior? How do I understand the risk? And, um, you know, what can I do to control the behavior of this entire service and uh, yeah. tailor it to my organization? Thanks, Bala. I think that was uh, that's really helpful, kind of breaking down exactly how policy control works. So as Bala mentioned, right, there's a lot of uh, key cool capabilities in bringing together the different policy control. And what we do is tie it all together with Citrix Analytics to give you the visibility so you can actually know and monitor and then tweak those policies uh, so that they work the best based on your security posture and requirements. So let's actually look at what we do with user behavior analytics. 
So one of the things is that all those uh, sites, that websites that Bala was talking about, and he talked about a reputation score, that information is actually used and sent to Citrix Analytics. And along with that, all the information that is used in terms of what sites are used uh, are being accessed by web, by different users, that is used in uh, by Citrix Analytics to create what is called as a risk score. And the risk score essentially is a way to quantify potential risk. Uh, it's a number between zero to hundred. Uh, I mean, you know, broadly speaking, it, it it can vary. There is a, obviously an algorithm in the in the background on how it works. But what we see on the dashboard is these tiles on the top, where each of the websites that are being accessed based on the risk score, they're actually categorized. So if you have uh, websites that are, highly, that are known to be malicious, that are known to be bad, they're obviously going to show up in those red and yellow tiles. And anything that's supposed to be clean, sanctioned, it's going to show up in the green. And explicitly blocked URLs or categories will go into the block category. So you'll actually get a very good sense using this dashboard on what kind of real posture and what is your overall assessment of risk from the standpoint of you know how people are using applications. The other thing that's important is you can always drill down and go back in time and actually look at all the different you know transactions, if you will. Uh, basically, these are all the domain uh, domain names and websites that users have actually accessed. So it becomes pretty easy for you to be able to you know use that and govern policy. And like the, like I mentioned, um, all of this data goes into Citrix Analytics to do that risk scoring. So if you click on a specific user, you can get pretty detailed uh, timeline view of how that user's risk actually progressed and what is the basis on which this risk score is computed. One thing to note here is that. The data is not only coming from access control. The risk score is computed based on data that is coming from across the Citrix ecosystem. So if you have endpoint management, or if you have ShareFile, and many other, other products deployed, all of those actually contribute to the overall, overall uh, uh, aggregate score. Uh, one other new addition that has been added to uh, analytics, and particularly for access control, is this new search and filter-based troubleshooting. So when in Citrix Analytics, you have the ability to actually go in and launch this very easy and simple search-based tool. And there is a drop-down for access. What that, what that does is now it allows you to search all the data and all the logs that we just saw very quickly. And you can use a very simple and easy uh, filter mechanism. Uh, you have obviously have some built-in uh, filters and facets on the left side, like I can quickly filter based on you know, the category of uh, websites that have been accessed or things like whether you know, what type of content it belongs to and reputation and so on and so forth. It's a pretty neat troubleshooting tool. So let's view. So that was all the admin capabilities, right? We, we kind of reviewed the four um, core components of how the solution is built. Now let's look at what is the end user going to experience based on the different you know, policies that we actually set up in place and all the single sign-on. So the first uh, you know, uh, experience that I want to sh kind of show you is when Workspace app is used. So this is the embedded browser. You typically install it on your desktop. Uh, and when an end user tries to go to one of the published SaaS applications, this is going to open up in the standard browser if no enhanced security is turned on. So Bala talked about the enhanced security checkbox. And this, in, in this case, since we haven't enforced any uh, policies, they get single signed on and they can actually access their app. But if we have enhanced security turned on, then depending on the specific browser controls as well as the cloud controls, uh, you will actually see different behavior. So in this case, we have turned on the watermark. And it's open, it opens up in the embedded browser that's locally installed. And let's say you now try to access Salesforce, and within Salesforce you have your applications, then you'll continue to be within that app. This is all allowed. So you know, you'll, you'll, you'll basically be allowed to go to those sites. If there is a site that is malicious or bad, or if it's in the block category, you'll see this access restricted page. And for everything else that was in that gray category that really Bala was explaining, that will all go into secure browser. And all this is seamlessly happening without you, know, you having to go and change too many things and tweak too many things. Let's say your end user is using a machine that does not have workspace app installed. Let's say they're working from uh, you know, home or some other place, and they have to get some stuff done. And let's say they have to log into their work application. So they can always go to the web version, web URL for workspace. And it's a, there's a very similar behavior. 
But if you remember, one thing that Bala mentioned is if we don't have Workspace app locally installed, what we do is we instantiate a secure browser session automatically in the cloud. So what the uh, access control service is doing is it actually detects that this particular user's session is coming from outside of Workspace app. So we need to en enforce it, and we actually automatically create this. So this is a very, very important point that you have, in both use cases, you have the ability to enforce uh, policy control. And obviously, depending on whether the site is allowed or blocked, you know, we take appropriate action. And anything that is obviously within the uh, secure browser um, service as a redirected URL, we already have the instance. So we'll just go ahead and you know, launch it within that. Now, one other use case is SP-initiated flow. Um, that's kind of the technical term, but what it really means is you, if you want to directly access the SaaS application outside of the Workspace app uh, icon, and let's say you directly use the link that is published uh, by the uh, service provider, then what you can do is similar behavior. In this case, you would go and use your corporate portal. It's pretty common. A lot of people embed that URL and make it easy and convenient for people to use access to the SaaS app, or the user may directly go and type that URL. Now, depending on whether single sign-on is turned on or not, you will see, again, similar uh, different behavior. If policy is turned on, then we will instantiate the secure browser. Again, same behavior, right? Uh, one thing you notice here is that for, for the single sign-on, uh, we do need to make sure that your SaaS app or your service provider has turned the uh, login URL. So it's typically something that you would do as part of your configuration, but it's, it's an important requirement. And obviously, if it's allowed or denied, the same policy applies. So irrespective of how you access your sanctioned applications, you can get these policy controls enforced. Now, I thought it would be helpful to just you know, compare and contrast these different browsers and what that experience really looks like. And this is a very common question we get from uh, a lot of people. So the main takeaway here is that if you are using the embedded browser, obviously you have a very fully native experience. And also, uh, this, this runs and all the policy control is, as far as uh, the cloud app controls are concerned, they are enforced locally on the device. Whereas if you're using secure browser, it's all enforced in the cloud. And very soon, uh, as of now, we don't have access control and the CAS integration for native browser. But that is something we're working on in the roadmap, and it will be available soon. So when, once that is available, you will be able to use your, uh, you know, your standard browser and still get the web filtering controls. So today we have the cloud app controls. That's the SP-initiated flow I showed you. But web filtering, and uh, that will actually be available. On the, that's, all, uh, that's coming on the roadmap. I have a small demo on that. I'll show you how it, how it looks. So one other uh, really nice capability that, that many people have asked us is, um, you know, I like workspace. It's great. All the capabilities are nice. But what if I am you know, on a transition to the cloud? I'm on a journey to the cloud. Uh, we have significant investments with Storefront, and we're in that. How do we actually you know, still consume some of this and, and embark on that journey? So this would be your typical Storefront, front-ended uh, by uh, a, a gateway. And depending on whether your users, uh, where, where they're coming from, they will actually be able to access their applications using Workspace app. So in this case, it's actually the Storefront uh, user interface. And you have access control, which gives you the ability to connect to all these SaaS apps and enforce policy control. So what we've done is we've actually added a new functionality, which will be available in Tech Preview soon. And what it'll do is it'll actually sync all the uh, SaaS app and web app definitions uh, that we have put into Workspace. And we present them as icons on, your, uh, on, on the storefront portal. Uh, so there is a utility that you have to run that actually runs on your DDC, and it basically does a periodic sync and pulls all those uh, SaaS app definitions and web app definitions we've already created. So it's using the public APIs internally to be able to do that. But the nice thing about this is now it enables you to sort of you know, use this in hybrid deployments. And this was obviously announced yesterday at the keynote. And uh, what, what's important here is you will need to have uh, entitlement to access control to be able to use this functionality, but it sort of acts as the bridge. And uh, over time, you know, obviously, as you move over to workspace, you can consume everything within workspace. So let me show you a demo of how this thing works and how how the actual experience looks like.
So I have the storefront portal here. Uh, we have published Salesforce as a secure app with all the policy control. So the, when, when you log in the very first time, what you would actually see is that watermark appear. Uh, we've actually disabled uh, cut, copy, paste, and we have put in download and print restrictions. So let's say you, can, you actually try to go and, and uh, uh, click on a file, it shows up, but you know you, you still see that you can actually drag and copy, paste anything. The download is prevented as well. And all of this is, by the way, happening from the access that I started with the storefront. So this is for a SaaS application. Now, let's say you go back and you want to actually do the same thing for Workday, which is another SaaS application. You're single signed on. Uh, I didn't have to go ahead and you know, enter my password. Um, and same behavior, right? Depending on what policy controls have been enabled, you see all these security controls in place. So uh, it's, it's pretty neat for, from that standpoint. Now, one other thing is um, if, I, if I try to you know, browse the web page, that particular watermark is going to show up front and center, so you're actually kind of protected. Let's go in and uh, actually try to launch uh, another application here. Uh, oh, in this case, that's it. Actually, as far as my demo is that's what I have. So we already showed you the web access. It's going to be similar. So we can do this for SaaS applications and web applications. So all of the policy control capabilities are fully supported with this new feature now. So with that, uh, let's, let's go in. So what's, what's next, right? So Bala actually in one of his slides already talked about it, but I want to sort of go into some a little bit more detail. The ability to use the native browser also and have a consistent policy for web filtering. And where this really becomes interesting and important is that secure browser integration. Because what you could do is uh, you can obviously use uh, you know, other third-party solutions for web filtering and use that to block sites. But if you wanted the same consistent experience for all your sanctioned and work applications, as well as your unsanctioned content, uh, and, you, and if, what if your users actually were to go through their own favorite native browser, this functionality will help address that gap. So in the first phase, uh, we are working on a, 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 a proxy auto configuration pack file based approach. Uh, you, will definitely, you will need to have your machine be MDM managed or GPO managed. So it's important that you know, uh, that, that particular machine's uh, pack file is not changed. So that is a requirement. But typically, if you have one of those conditions, then this, this, this solution should work fine. Uh, in the first phase, we won't have uh, some of the advanced use cases like SSL bypass and reception. But those are you know, something we're considering for the future. And uh, one other important thing is that you will uh, be, uh, as an end user, you will be authenticated uh, just like a, a workspace uh, end user. So uh, that kind of adds an extra layer of security when they're accessing any of their sanctioned or unsanctioned applications. So let's actually look at a demo now. How would this, how, how does this look like? So in this case, uh, I have, I'm going to go in and launch a, launch my favorite browser. So I first of all, uh, I, let me walk you through the admin experience. So this is the access control GUI uh, on the console. And here we, have, we will have a new section called native browser settings, where all you really need to do is turn on the ability to use web filtering for native browsers. Uh, that's your packed file. Uh, it's hosted in the cloud. And what you're going to do is you will typically uh, you know, have this configuration done through a tool like GPO. <laughs> But in this use case, I'm going to actually go ahead and turn on automatic pack file configuration by copy pasting that URL. And that's pretty much it. Once this step is done, the other uh, requirement is to actually install a certificate, which obviously I don't have in this demo, but that will be a requirement. So that will make sure that you, know, you have a trust relationship between the client and our, our proxy. Now, when I log in to Workspace um, as using my you know, Workspace credentials, uh, which will be AD or what ha whatever uh, you have, then at that point in time, I get the same experience, right? Uh, if it's an allowed uh, uh, application, now let's say if it was Bing, you know, it loaded, it was sanctioned. Um, and in, if it's a blog site, automatically uh, we're now able to block that. And we didn't start from workspace, we just started from our native browser. It was the same exact experience. And let's say this is uh, for, let's some other application. I mean, Bala talked about some of the social media websites like Instagram. If you try to go to one of those sites, then we'll automatically be able to enforce that through the secure browser. 
Finally, uh, I want to actually sort of you know, give you a view into one other capability that we announced at Keynote yesterday, which is also part of the overall uh, access control solution. And this is about uh, adding more app protection capabilities and l increasing that list of different kind of you know, browser-based controls that we can apply. So we are uh, announcing two new capabilities. One is the ability to you know, block and obfuscate data when it's uh, being maybe trapped by a keylogger. So there's an anti-keylogger capability that will be built in to the Workspace app. And at the same time, we'll also have the ability to you know, uh, have the screen capture sort of obfuscated. So what, what that will look like essentially is these new two new checkboxes that you will see in your uh, workspace configuration when you go into an enhanced security, and you can turn them on, on or off. I, now, one requirement is that for these controls to work, you do, have, you do need to have the workspace app installed. These capabilities will not work in the web version. And the main reason is that since keyloggers actually are like a local agent that might actually be obfuscating and resident on your network, on your device, we do need to make sure that these, are, these can be enforced on the local machine. So those are some really new uh, capabilities uh, that are all on the roadmap and will be you know, sort of uh, announcing their availability over the uh, next coming quarters. With that, uh, I kind of were towards the end of our session. Uh, I do want to draw your attention to a couple of other sessions where we will be covering similar content. Uh, we have an identity and access management session later in the day uh, at 4.30. So very similar capabilities, but uh, also giving you a view of what are the other you know, ac uh, identity capabilities that we're working on in terms of you know, partners and so on and so forth. And then uh, you know, don't forget to rate our session and give us feedback. If you like this session, let us know. If you didn't like us, still let us know whatever new things that you would like to be seen in future. So with that, I think uh, we have a few minutes to take questions. Thanks, Praveen. Um, from an identity perspective, um, customers that maybe just use Google Authenticator to get in, uh -huh. do they also need to run a shadow AD for things like Storefront and Netscaler in order to allow that authentication for this service, or can they just do it with the Google? So in your case, uh, if they're using Google IDP, Google, uh, that's it, okay. So what you would do is you would, you would use the on-prem gateway for now uh, because on-prem gateway has the ability to be able to you know, federate identity to some of the other providers. And that would be the way you can bring Google IDP along with, uh, you know, along with uh, access control. Uh, sorry, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch the question. No, Active Directory will be. Oh, OK. So your question is about, do we support Google uh, uh, user directory? Yeah. So not yet. That is something that is, that is being considered by the identity team. And uh, uh, we can connect you to the uh, um, identity product manager on timelines. Citrus Cloud now has at least three different connector requirements to full utilize service between the general cloud connector, now the gateway connector, and the ADM agent. Are we going to see a consolidation across that so that we can provide customers a single endpoint to connect with all Citrus Cloud functionality? Yes. The answer is, the short answer is yes. Uh, we are very well aware of the proliferation of connectors as we start you know, going more and more. So there is an effort going on um, without actually being able to exactly give you specific timelines. But it's very, very soon uh, we are working on unifying the ability to you know, have one single connector that will actually be able to do these things. And there are some architectural changes which will allow us to be a lot more agile in how we kind of roll out these capabilities from a connector standpoint. So, yeah. so yes, uh, good question. Any more questions? OK, so the question is, uh, what is the method required to connect storefront to the cloud? Yeah, so uh, for apps and desktops, you would typically use the cloud connector. And the, uh, and, and the cloud connector essentially helps you make those outbound connections for all your data traffic, which are uh, going through the gateway service. Uh, cloud connector also acts as a way for you to be able to connect your AD or on-prem. So that's the mechanism. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much.
Thank you.